it's up and running. Okay, well, welcome uh, everyone to our fall material text roadshow. Uh, I'm Zach Lesser, um, professor of English, one of the co-organizers of the seminar, along with Jerry Singerman, uh, editor emeritus of the press. Hello. And, and John Pollock, who is a curator in the Kissack Center. And I think John can say hello right now. And Island Malcolm, who is our graduate fellow. So the idea of the roadshow was born um, shortly after the lockdown in April 2020, uh, when we decided to move online and try a new format, brief talks on a specific theme by multiple people on an item or two that's near and dear to them. And I think the conjunction of these talks has always been interesting, um, sometimes perfect synchronicity, sometimes awkward, uh, but never dull. And we hope the same will be true tonight. Quick reminder that next week as well, we will be entirely virtual. So please don't show up um, in the library. Our speakers are not, we're not able to travel to the US. Um, so we'll be online hosting Andrew Pedigree and Arthur Derpaduvin of University of St. Andrews. He'll be talking about recovering the lost books of early modern Europe and um, should be a great talk. They'll be staying up very late to bring it to us. So please join us for that and feel free to invite others as always who might be interested. You can always get on our listserv by going to our website at penmaterialtext.org. Okay. So as always, we'll have plenty of time for discussion after the presentations. Just use that raise hand function and, and I'll call on you to unmute and ask your question. Now I'll introduce all our speakers um, together very briefly since we have three of them and then I'll turn it over to them. Um, Brian Cassidy is one half of the book selling firm Type Punch Matrix, which he founded with Rebecca Romney in 2019. That firm incorporated his earlier one, Brian Cassidy Bookseller, founded in 2004. Type Punch Matrix specializes in the 20th century avant-garde, including small magazines produced by mimeography and other repro graphics. And he regularly teaches a class on identifying and understanding 20th century duplicating technologies for the Rare Book School at University of Virginia. Michelle Warren is Professor of Comparative Literature at Dartmouth and Director of the Mellon Mays Undergraduate Fellowship Program there. Michelle's motto, according to her faculty webpage anyway, is the Middle Ages aren't old. And that's true of her research, which is focused on how medieval manuscripts have been remediated digitally and otherwise. She runs the website and project team, Remix the Manuscript, a chronicle of digital experiments, and is completing a book called Holy Digital Grail, a medieval book on the internet, which will be published by Stanford in March. Jessica Linker is a longtime friend of the Material Text Seminar, former library company and McNeil Center fellow, former Bryn Mawr professor, and still a Philadelphia at heart. But she's now assistant professor of history at Northeastern, where she also runs Huskyana Press, an experiential letterpress studio. If you've been coming to the seminar for a while, you'll remember her brilliant presentation in 2017 on Ben Franklin's anti-counterfeiting technology. She won the Zuckerman Dissertation Prize from the McNeil Center, and she's finishing a book on women's scientific work in early America. So now I'm going to mute myself and turn it over to you, Brian. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Zach and John and everybody else at, at Penn for inviting me and for bringing me here. Um, uh, as um, Zach mentioned, I'm, I'm a bookseller by trade. Um, and uh, But for the last eight or nine years, I've been working on a, on a project on understanding and identifying um, duplicating and copying processes beginning in the 19th century, but really in the 20th century. And this began for me really as, as a bookseller, as a way of making sure that um, when I'm handling these kind of materials that I'm handling um, you know, authentic, not later reproductions, not later reprintings, um, not forgeries. Um, but it's really evolved from there because one of the things that I, I quickly kind of realized is that a lot of these materials are in many ways bibliographically invisible um, because we often don't have the, the quite the right tools um, uh, to, tease out how they were printed and, and why they were printed and who did them and in what kind of contexts and with what machines. Um, and so what I'd like to talk about today 
um, uh, just for a little bit is about one specific item that, that I only recently acquired, only about five or six months ago um, from a colleague um, that I'm still kind of asking questions about. Um, and I just thought I would kind of walk you through um, uh, the item itself, how I approached it, the sorts of questions um, that it raises for me and the sort of tentative answers that I've come to. Um, and and um, I'm, I'm kind of also honestly hoping that, that maybe some of you might have some productive ideas um, for additional areas um, or additional lines of inquiry. Um, so with that, I'm gonna um, share my screen here real quick. Um, Okay, can everybody see that? Have I done that properly? Yes? Okay. Okay, um, so what I'd like to talk to you today about is um, this unusual edition of, of John Hershey's Hiroshima. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the, the history of Hiroshima in a, in a minute for those who aren't familiar with it. Um, but um, like I say, about six months ago, a colleague emailed me a quote. Uh, uh, a, lot of my, a lot of my dealer friends know that this is an area that I'm interested in. And he, he said, um, you know, I have this odd little photo reproduction of um, Hershey's Hiroshima, it's the complete text, um, but it's on this watermarked paper and it's in this weird format. Um, and in fact, I can even hold it up here. I'll show a picture of it in a minute, but it's, it's in this weird little photo album, essentially. Um, and he gave a kind of quote and, and sort of hypothesized that this was maybe a reprint um, uh, shortly after it appeared in the New Yorker. Um, and uh, I was interested in it because he talked about it as a reduced format um, and a photo reproduction. So I asked for some images um, and he, why is that? Uh, there we go. Um, he sent me a couple images. This is one of them. And my initial reaction to this was not that this was photo reproduced, by which I assumed he meant photo offset um, uh, or photo uh, uh, duplicated. Um, but uh, this really looked like mimeography to me. This looked like it was mimeographed, which made sense for a number of different reasons, not the least of which is the height of, of mimeography really is the post-war period. Um, uh, uh, when a, a number of things happened, when um, the, the main one being that it had been around for several decades, long enough to do two things. The, the first one would be to reach a kind of market saturation, but the second one would be that there were used machines as well that would then sort of um, uh, uh, trickle down to um, amateur printers as well. So really, if you're thinking about the peak, it's really kind of the post-war period um, after World War II, but before xerography um, really kind of gets to the fore. Um, so I, I was sort of thinking this was a mimeographed piece. Um, uh, I asked him to send it to me for me to take a look at. And, um, and then I just sort of, sort of, before it came, I started thinking about how this might fit into the history of Hiroshima itself. Um, and I think all of us are at least kind of broadly aware of, of, of the history of, of Hershey's Hiroshima, which was that it took up um, for the first time, and I believe only time, an entire issue of the New Yorker, the August 30, uh, 31st, 1946 issue of the New Yorker was entirely taken up. Um, by Hershey's account of six survivors of the atomic bomb, um, uh, the America's dropping of the atomic bomb at Hiroshima. Um, and it was enormously popular. The stories sort of say that it sold, sold out in an hour. Um, there were apparently th about 300,000 newsstand copies. Um, uh, whether it was an hour or not, it, it sold very, very quickly and it was quickly in demand. Um, and was even trading sort of on the secondhand market in 1946 um, at prices approaching $20. Um, it was published about two months later in October of 1946, um, first in a trade edition um, from Random House, I believe, um, and then eventually uh, the next month as a book club selection. Um, so it very quickly appeared in print and then very quickly got very wide circulation thanks to the book club. Um, but, um, and then eventually, you know, as, as we all probably know, went through multiple editions um, uh, over the years. It's never been out of print. It's been published in multiple languages, millions of copies in print. Um, and we're all probably most familiar with the little paperback edition that you can still get um, there on the bottom right. Um, but between the two points of its appearance in the New Yorker and its eventual publication um, as a trade edition in October, um, between about those six weeks, um, there was an enormous gap of demand. Um, this was a, this was really a sensation in no small part because this was really the first unvarnished account of what happened at either Nagasaki or Hiroshima. Um, there, there had been Brian, a lot of, yes. Sorry to interrupt you. We're no. still seeing just the initial slide. I don't know. It, I think you yeah. tried to advance. You may just need to start the slideshow. Let me start it then... again. Yeah, sorry. Um, 
so uh, so yeah, th there's the the August 1946 New Yorker, the trade edition, um, the book club edition looked remarkably similar, the various editions. Um, but as I was saying, there, there was an enormous gap between these publications, the six or seven weeks between the appearance by Random House and the New Yorker issue. Um, the New Yorker quickly issued um, an off print um, that also quickly sold out. Um, and uh, uh, the editors and Hershey sat down and, and they decided that this was really, the story was kind of bigger than any of them. And they, they really felt that they had an obligation to have this read as widely as possible. Um, and so they, they basically um, allowed for uh, the reprint rights to be sold for very, very inexpensive rates. It was, I believe, 15 cents for every 10,000 readers and all that money went to the Red Cross. Um, and so what you started to see was um, uh, Hershey's entire account appearing in um, magazine, in uh, newspapers at the time. Here it is in the St. Louis Dispatch. You can see September 16th, a couple weeks after the New Yorker appeared. Um, it also, though, appeared in sort of various little tiny editions that, that, that were done for um, fundraising. This is just a little record of um, one that I found in OCLC or, or WorldCat um, that was done for, as you can see, the Emergency Committee of Atomic Scientists in Princeton. Um, and so here's the original description that the, the dealer sent me. So he had kind of assumed that this photo reproduction was one of these reprints. And that seemed like a reasonable supposition to me um, when I finally got it. Um, and again, here's the here's the sort of modest little album that I got. Um, and you can see that it's sort of oddly formatted. Um, when you open it up, it's bound actually at the top of the page. Um, so you're flipping it like a reporter's notebook almost. Um, and again, when I got it, I really was still thinking that this was mimeography. Um, the printing is not very good. Um, offset printing tends to be of a much higher quality, tends to be much crisper. Um, the blacks tend to be much deeper. Um, it had the, it was on, uh, you, we can't see this in person, but it's on a kind of very porous paper that's very common to mimeography because it, um, this is not, uh, for, those, for those who aren't familiar with it, mimeography is, is essentially a stencil process. Um, you type on a stencil, you wrap it around an ink-filled drum, and with every turn of the drum, a little bit of the ink gets pressed through the stencil and onto the clean sheet underneath it. Um, so it's, it's something of a crude technology and you often get the kind of variations in ink flow that you can see on this page. Um, you also often get offsetting of the ink from one copy to the next. In other words, as it's coming off the machine and going into the tray, um, it's still a little bit wet. So the, um, the uh, versos of the pages coming off often pick up the wet ink from the rectos of the, of the uh, copies that just came off before it. Um, and I saw evidence of that, as you can see here. Um, there was also a significant amount of bleed through um, on, the, on the versos of the pages. Um, again, this is very typical of mimeography and not terribly typical of offset. Um, again, offset tends to be much more exact and much more professional process. Um, running an offset duplicator um, is something that an average person could learn to do, but very rarely learn to do. Um, it, was, it was usually operated by a trade um, person of one form or another, whereas a mimeograph um, was operated by all sorts of, of different people. And although it was messy, it was not terribly complicated. Um, but a number of things sort of started making me question that attribution, or at least sort of beginning to recognize kind of an inherent weirdness about it. The first is um, the fact that it was in this album, and it was in this album on this on, on these this leaf size that was very unusual. Um, the leaf size, I'm just going to go back for one quick second just to refresh my memory, but it's, yeah, it's about nine and, a, and three quarters by six and seven eighths. It's actually, that's actually a little off. Um, but, uh, but in any event, it didn't seem to be in any kind of standard um, page size, which again, for mimeography would have been very strange. You could always trim a stencil down. You could always, you know, stencils came basically in, in standard sizes, um, most commonly eight and a half by 11, and then a legal size as well. Um, and, you know, while you could certainly type only in the middle of the stencil and run smaller pages through, this was just something that was unusual um, and just something that I took note of. Um, Another thing that I started to notice was, um, sorry, here we go, um, was that at the bottoms of certain pages, I could see the ghosts of the text on the subsequent pages. So if you look down here, you can see sort of the tops of certain letter forms. And this appeared on a number of different pages, this sort of ghost of the last line. Um, and you can see that the ghost is there, even though the page number, if you look down in the lower corner here, is very clear. Um, here's another one. 
Um, and then this one, I'm going to show you, um, you can see that it says sort of to something. And if you go to the next page, you can see to sit down for a moment. Here they are on the same page um, where you can see that it's really this kind of shadow of the top line of the next page, which again was very strange. And, and I couldn't think of a reason why if this was mimeographed, that would happen. Um, that's much more of a almost a, a, a photo um, a remnant of some kind. Um, I also began to notice that there seemed to be um, places where the um, I was either seeing a reproduced page edge as on the bottom here, or places where maybe the TypeScript had been spliced together. Um, and again, you don't see this in mimeography. Um, uh, we'll be more familiar with this from having made, made, made photocopies ourselves, from having made Xeroxes. You'll also get, you often get a reproduced page edge. Um, but I couldn't think of a reason why this would necessarily be in a mimeograph. Um, so there's a few more of those where it, look, where it looks like there's some kind of splice. Um, so I, there was some evidence that there was some sort of photo intervention here, but, but at the same time, this really did not look like offset lithography to me in any way, shape or form. Um, but I started to sort of think about what was, where are some useful points of inquiry might be. And um, so I started to think about the sheet size. Um, and I, I, this is a tweet that I did at the time, um, which is bibliography in action. This is me trying to figure out um, uh, why you might size a sheet this way and trying to work with the type, uh, uh, the size of the fonts and um, just trying to make sense of, of the sheet size. Um, and also trying to make sense of the fact that the sheets, uh, that the sheets had these weird um, watermarks on them. Um, this is, I believe, Athena with her owl. Um, and then one of them actually said peace. Um, this is a watermark in it. And as I noticed, much as you do in hand press collation, that the watermark moved around the page. Um, so I started to wonder about what the, what the actual size of the leaf was. Um, and that's when I noticed that the TypeScript or, or the, the, the text that I had in front of me had exactly 64 pages. Um, so then I started doing some math. Um, and eventually I came to realize that if I measured this thing very, very precisely, the leaf size was actually um, 6 inch, 6.95 inches by 9.85 inches, which is exactly one eighth of a B2 sheet of commercial paper. Um, so a, a B2 sheet is a, is, a large, is a large sheet that really, again, is only used commercially, um, but it's a standard commercial leaf size. And that leaf size is, is 19.7 by 27.8. Um, so if you want to picture what this looks like, if you sort of turn this to the, to the right, you can see it gets divided into eighths, and that's how you, you end up with this. So if we sort of lay the TypeScript out on the floor, which I did, um, it would look like this. Um, this was almost certainly how it was printed. Um, and if this is how it was printed, then it can't be a mimeograph. And it can't be a mimeograph because they don't make mimeographs that can take sheets this big. They don't make stencils this big. Um, uh, what does take a sheet this big would be um, a large uh, uh, offset machine. Um, so all of those things kind of um, uh, triangulating all of that information, I kind of came to, to the conclusion that this was some sort of photo offset um, where they had kind of laid the TypeScript in eighths down on eight large leaves of, of this B2 paper um, and then trimmed it and assembled it. Um, and what I was beginning to suspect, what, what I was really looking at, even though it looked like Mimeo, um, it was actually what I refer to as bad offset, um, which is um, sort of the scourge of, we talk about this in my class at RBS, it's sort of the scourge of um, 20th century duplication because it can be very hard to distinguish these two. Um, and you get bad offset from any number of things. You can get bad offset from an operator who, doesn't, who isn't fully versed in the machine. You can get bad offset from um, from a bad uh, photo plate. In other words, you, you, you don't get a sharp image um, or a sharp negative. You can get bad offset from environmental factors in the print shop. Um, you can get it from any number of variables. Um, but the, the end result is that it presents very much like mimeography. Um, and so what we in, in, in essence have here is actually an octavo. Um, we have a weird little octavo. Um, and one of the things I'd like to say about duplication is, is that, in fact, they often behave much more like hand press materials um, than they do um, uh, commercial industrial size um, printing of the 19th and the 20th century. Um, 
but I still had this question of sort of what did I have, even if it was printed this way, what exactly do, do I have? And I don't fully know, um, but I, I have a kind of working hypothesis um, that I am uh, I'm, I'm sort of trying to disprove or at least add to. Um, and the working hypothesis is this, um, there were, so Hershey's text was printed all over the United States, um, as I said, um, but one of the places where it was not published until 1949 was Japan. Um, and it was not published in Japan because there was occupation censorship under, under um, MacArthur and the occupying forces, and especially um, uh, stringent uh, censorship and um, uh, uh, printing laws regarding um, anything having to do with um, either of the two atomic bomb sites. Um, and this included photographic material as well. Um, so Hiroshima was not, did not appear in Japan until three years after it was published. Um, and I am sort of operating under half of, a, half of a suspicion that this is a piracy that was printed in Japan. Um, and I believe that for a couple different reasons. Um, one is uh, the, first of all, this is a very, very flimsy, um, uh, a very, very flimsy album. Um, it actually doesn't feel like most other photo albums that, that, that I've um, handled. Um, and the end papers of this, which is what this is an image of, the end papers are incredibly thin. Um, they're almost, dare I say, they're almost rice paper. Um, and uh, so th this has a, um, uh, this feels a little, little anomalous to me as a potentially American album. Um, just to contrast, I, I literally grabbed the nearest album that I had, um, which is from our next catalog, but it's a, it's a series of albums that were put together by a Japanese American woman in, in around 1946. And you can see that this is just much better um, constructed. Um, uh, and that's much more typical of the sorts of albums that, that, that I would see. Um, there's also something of, um, there's something very intentional about the use obviously of the word peace as a watermark. Um, I have not been able to trace down any of these watermarks, um, which makes me think that this is probably custom, maybe, I don't know. Um, but uh, it, it seems to me that it was done much in the um, Princeton atomic bomb um, off print that we discussed at the, at the top of this, um, some sort of maybe a fundraiser, um, or, or again, maybe some sort of Samas dot kind of publication. Um, the other reason I think this, and I haven't been able to prove this yet, um, but if you think about it, they took some kind of text and cut it up and laid it out um, to be able to do eight up on this sheet of paper. Um, and my thinking is that maybe this was a teletype or a news, um, a news wire of some kind. Most of those that I've seen at this point um, are usually all caps. Um, so I, I can't fully account for this. Maybe it was some sort of proof um, that was sent uh, to somebody I, and they cut it up. Um, but in any event, um, that's my current working hypothesis. But the, the real thing that I kind of want to want to um, emphasize here is that, you know, what is a curiosity without sort of some of the tools to begin to interrogate it, you really do begin to kind of tease out um, uh, some interesting bibliographical, uh, bibliographical issues and questions um, uh, when you um, have some of the tools to identify the methods of, of duplicating um, and printing. Um, so as I say, um, I'm going to end here with more questions than answers, um, but uh, uh, I'll be happy to take questions when uh, when we're done. Um, so with that, I'll hand it off to Zach. I'm not sure I've already forgotten who's Thanks. next. Thanks, Brian. Uh, that was great. Thank you. And I'm sure there'll be questions uh, about that to come, but let's turn it over to Michelle. Brian, if you can stop your screen yep. share. Thanks. No okay, problem. Michelle, go ahead. So now I didn't Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to take you backward and forward in time, um, and actually also pass through World War II along the way, as it so happens. Um, the book I am going to talk about is called MS-80. It's uh, housed in the Parker Library of Corpus Christi College, Cambridge, in the United Kingdom. It's a 15th century English book about King Arthur and the Holy Grail. Here it is on a, whoop, oh, no, that's not advancing. There it is on a table next to my laptop around 2018. Um, this image includes evidence 
of the book's existence across nearly 600 years, when it was made, collected, cataloged, edited, microfilmed, rebound, and digitized. I tell stories about all the dates that are listed here in my own book, which you can read very soon. But today I'm gonna to focus just on the brown leather that's just visible on the upper edge of the photo and also along the right edge of the book, the cover made in 1956. This part of MS-80 illustrates two points of my larger argument. The first, that handcraft, print, and photography influence each other in the modern copying of medieval manuscripts. And copying medieval manuscripts is a component of modern colonial capitalism. This is MS-80 on the shelf. Its bindings more or less the same as the other books nearby. According to the conservator Melvin Jefferson, these bindings were designed to mimic printed books that themselves mimicked medieval books. The raised cords on the spine are decorative replicas of a kind of sewing that holds together manuscript choirs. This style was used to enhance the value of printed books that were held together by glue, giving them the aura of ancient handcraft. About a third of the Parker collection has similar treatments. MS-80 is this one of many medieval books that is now also a copy of a medieval book with a handcrafted cover influenced by print. It is wrapped in the very nostalgia that it inspires. The context of this rebinding is recorded on, whoop, on the flyleaf on a piece of 1950s paper. It was rebound by John P. Gray of Green Street, returned to the library on February 23rd, 1956, signed in by the librarian, John Patrick Tulaburi, paid for by a grant from the Pilgrim Trust. The grant opens a vast geopolitical context for the conservation of Parker manuscripts. The trust was founded in 1930 by Edward Harkness, who sought to commemorate his English ancestry by helping Great Britain after the most recent war. The title Pilgrim commemorates an idealized vision of the English settlers who colonized the lands of the Wampanoag people in what is now called Massachusetts. Quote, it was called Pilgrim Trust to signify at once its dedication to an adventurous ideal and its link to the land of the Pilgrim Fathers. The trustees deepened the nostalgia with the trust emblem, quote, a scallop shell, which pilgrims wore in the Middle Ages in token of their having visited the shrine of St. James of Compostela. The shell made medieval English piety a model for modern English colonialism. The shell, the shell is sh shown here on the letterhead of the 1952 grant. The trustees interpreted their task as supporting cultural heritage, the arts, and social welfare. They prioritized medieval preservation projects because they believed that Americans found restoration particularly delightful. They thus translated values they considered distinctly American into British heritage projects. The 1952 grant was a modest expression of this principle. The Pilgrim Trust is part of a broader practice of early 20th century American philanthropy that continues to shape the copying and preservation of books. Harkness controlled an immense inherited fortune that made him among the wealthiest Americans of the day, third in line right behind John D. Rockefeller Sr. and Andrew Carnegie. Their wealth derived very directly from the 19th century appropriation of indigenous lands through a series of new US government policies. The rebinding note in MS-80 surfaces these debts to colonial capital that are carried to some degree by every modern repository. These are the conditions that keep the books open. In the same era that Harkness established the Pilgrim Trust, Carnegie and Rockefeller were funding new technologies for copying books, namely microfilm. Some of the impetus for scholarly copying came from the fact that other American collectors were driving up the price of books for libraries. Another motivation came from the sense that Europeans were endangering their own heritage through wartime destruction, 
and that Americans were better positioned to safeguard precious documents, not by moving them, but by copying them, that is, by microfilming them. There was a time in the 1940s when it seemed possible that the corpus of medieval English manuscripts could be reduced to the microfilms deposited at the US Library of Congress. Filming efforts were nationalist, scholarly organizations, foundations, and the government sought to copy manuscripts as part of creating a self-sustaining knowledge economy in the United States. In a 1943 report to the American Council of Learned Societies, the medieval historian William Jerome Wilson noted that some scholars and librarians felt that, quote, the deteriorating state of affairs in Europe meant that the center of learning would shift to the United States. American scholars would need a full collection of manuscript copies in order to carry on what Europeans could no longer sustain. Quote, Someone observing, sadly, the racial and cultural divisions of Europe has remarked that only in America has it been possible to develop anything that can properly be termed a European race and a European civilization. Perhaps the compilation of a complete bibliographical catalog of the priceless manuscript records of Europe also awaits American execution with the microfilm copy as the medium. This someone was suggesting that the war that began in 1940, 1939, resulted partly from Europe's lack of racial coherence, whereas white Europeans in the United States, despite their different national origins, saw themselves as a unified race. From within this framework of white supremacy, Wilson posited that good American microfilm cataloging could give Europe what Europe lacked a unified cultural record. A consolidated bibliography could lead to a consolidated identity. This racialization of European heritage tied to manuscript microfilms reflects the totalizing views of culture and race implicit in the very idea of mass copying. At some point around this time, MS-80 was also microfilmed. To use that film today, you likely need a computer at least that's what I found the last time I tried. On this machine, a microfilm becomes a digital copy itself. If you scroll too fast, it pixelates. Around 2006, MS-80 was photographed again for Parker Library on the web. The 1950s bindings played a key role. They were too stiff for photography because the books were held too closed but they also weren't considered historically significant. Changing them would actually improve the preservation of the books. The 1950s hide glue was replaced with purified wheat starch paste. The spines were modified to include a paper hollow to support the leaves when the book opens. High-tech handcrafted conservation was the condition of high-tech photography. Even in the vault, then, MS-80 is simultaneously a medieval paper manuscript, a modern printed book, and a book reproduced by digital photography. So when isn't a medieval book? Whenever you can open it. On the shelf next to 79, MS-80 is a 20th century book produced by American Anglophilia and Bookbinder's equally nostalgic vision of medieval technologies. On microfilm, MS-80 is a 20th century roll produced by the Nationalist Do Development of Document Preservation. And on the internet, MS-80 is a 21st century digital interface sustained again by American commitments to English heritage as a global asset. It remains to be seen today which copy will last longest, the one on the shelf, the one on the film, or the one on the internet. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks very much. Our last speaker before, and then we'll open it up for discussion is Jessica. Mute myself first. Uh, all right, let me, uh, hopefully, let me know if I um, do not advance this properly. 
Uh, so first of all, thank you um, to the organizers of Material Text for bringing me here today. Um, tonight, I wanted to talk about an object that I first encountered at New York Public Library in 2012. Uh, I briefly wrote about it in my dissertation, but I'm coming back to this object for my current book project on women's scientific practice in early America. Um, this is the title page of Mary Minot's Medical Botany, which reads Botanical Drawings and Descriptions by Mary Minot, lost in 1820. The book is a slender hand-sewn volume with torn greenish gray wrappers. Um, the content consists of six watercolor drawings of plants, which are accompanied by rudimentary botanical descriptions. Uh, these descriptions include some sense of the plants placed within a botanical hierarchy, usually class and order according to the artificial system of taxonomy, and less often the genus and species, with Mary favoring the plant's common name for title headings instead. Other details might include geographic distribution, morphological traits, and medicinal properties, all conveyed simply as a child might write, uh, because a child, in fact, did write this book. Mary Minot was roughly eight or nine years old when she completed this. So two questions spring to mind, or may spring to mind. Uh, one, why is a nine-year-old girl creating a medical botany in 1820? And two, what does this have to do with copying technologies? Uh, so through this object, I want to think about this nine-year-old's labor within a broader culture of copying botanical plates to train women and young girls to participate in the production of illustrated scientific books. Uh, these were not original drawings and descriptions, but copies of color plates that appeared in the first uh, second and fourth parts of Jacob Bigelow's American Medical Botany, uh, which was issued between 17, uh, 1817 and 1821 in six parts. Uh, this brief talk uh, builds on a published article I wrote for Early American Studies, uh, where I emphasized that the process of hand coloring scientific plates uh, is as much technology as is color printing. And the task that we perceive as rote copying uh, when properly contextualized usually expose years of training at the intersection of art and science, as well as sophisticated scientific choices. Um, but Man Mary's manuscript here speaks more to the training phase. Uh, it's the kind of object that young girls would produce to learn botanical terms and concepts necessary for doing certain types of coloring work. Uh, so Mary Minot's manuscript is hiding in a folder with other unrelated scientific manuscripts. Uh, New York Public Library seems to have acquired it in June 1934 from Thomas J. Taylor, a book and ephemera dealer who provided no provenance. Um, the combination of Boston 1820 and a gift inscription from Mary to Theodore Sedgwick allows us to identify the creator as Mary Minot, uh, eldest child of William and Louisa Davis Minot, uh, born in 1911. Uh, I admit that there was a bit of serendipity involved in this identification. Uh, not long before I encountered it, I had been reading through the Minot and Sedgwick papers uh, at Massachusetts Historical Society, trying to piece together the life of Louisa, uh, who was an obscure American illustrator and artist who taught in Boston and authored uh, several textbooks. Um, the two families were friendly and interrelated in various ways. Uh, Theodore Sedgwick, in this case, is Theodore Sedgwick III, the grandson of Theodore Sedgwick I, um, who is a fairly famous early American lawyer. Um, Theodore III and Mary were the same age and friends. Uh, frustratingly, uh, although the Minot papers are vast, um, there is very little documentation of Mary's early years, uh, likely because of, fire, of a fire that damaged the family home on Beacon Street in 1824. Uh, but as the daughter of a relatively well-to-do Boston lawyer, I imagine that she had better access to education than most. Her brother really spent some time in the care of Elizabeth Palmer Peabody beginning in 1824. Uh, and a note from Peabody on one of Willie's letters home asked, um, asked uh, for, to give her love to 15-year-old Mary, um, but whether Peabody was once Mary's tutor or simply a friend of the family is hard to discern. Um, Peabody's earliest school was in fact open in 1820, but in Lancaster, not Boston, where the manuscript was made. Um, but in any case, uh, Peabody used Louisa Minot's textbooks in her school, and Louisa was known to teach art in Boston infant schools, uh, and it seems very probable that Mary's early art education at least might have been supervised by her mother. Um, Louisa herself had significant training. Uh, her surviving oil paintings are at the New York Historical Society, uh, and here we see a depiction of Niagara Falls, uh, possibly with Mary lurking in the background from 1818. Uh, various unpublished sketches with apologies for the terrible photograph um, 
these sketches and watercolors uh, reside at the Massachusetts Historical Society. And her published work is largely of Massachusetts landscapes, uh, such as this lithog uh, lithograph from Pendleton. Um, there is one surviving drawing by Mary, apart from this botanical manuscript, uh, which I unfortunately forgot to get a photograph of. Uh, but it's in this genre of Massachusetts scenery that her mother um, was producing. Uh, and so Louisa, through sketching with her children, uh, inculcated Mary's appreciation for nature um, in ways that were both aesthetic and technical. Um, Louisa's forays into education probably made her aware of a culture of making what some scholars have called painted herbaria. Uh, and this was the practice of keeping a collection of drawings of plants uh, copied from nature or from prints, uh, and was often used to train students to use art to think about science. Uh, female academies often taught drawing and body classes to help anatomize the plant. Uh, and so flower painting therefore produced botanical literacies necessary for coloring plates for scientific work. Uh, and this, as I argue elsewhere, often required long-term familiarity with plants to make decisions about details, even when provided with centralized coloring decisions. Um, one of the biggest challenges to producing color plate natural history books was figuring out representative colors for specimens. Um, plants, you know, as we know, very naturally in the wild. Uh, and dried and flattened terrestrial specimens found in traditional herbaria discolor very quickly. Uh, so the women who did coloring work for botanical text uh, tended to botanize regularly, and they often kept painted herbaria specifically as a record for color. Uh, painted herbaria, in fact, helped Jacob Bigelow create American Medical Botany, the book that Mary Minot is copying from. Uh, and this is an image from Ora White Hitchcock's Herbarium Parvum Pictum, begun in 1817. Um, these images include original drawings of lady slippers and a copy of an 18th century plate of foxglove. Um, Hitchcock copied pages by request. Um, some she sent along to Bigelow as he was working on the text of American Medical Botany. Um, surviving correspondence in Bigelow's account book for the work indicates that Bigelow received art from Hitchcock. Uh, and she and other women also supplies uh, drawings to Stephen W. Williams, uh, who in his 1849 report on the indigenous uh, medical botany of Massachusetts, uh, praised the genre of herbarium keeping, saying uh, that this is the most permanent and beautiful method of preparing what may be called a facsimile of an herbarium. Uh, there's no danger of the fading of plants from the ravages of time. So men are definitely relying on women keeping these things. Um, accuracy of color may have been particularly crucial in, as an identification factor with medical plants um, where mistaking a plant could be deadly. Uh, and in general, there was a sense that the different genres of herbaria better serve certain professional applications. Um, Laura Johnson, for example, in her uh, botany te textbooks uh, suggested that those interested in general study should keep a set of specimens according to their official system, those interested in medicine with a natural system, and serious students of botany should perhaps keep both. Uh, knowing all this, there are ways to read herbaria for these choices. So I have a theory that Mary's medical botany was part of a process of learning botany to prepare to paint color plates, uh, possibly alongside an adult woman doing the coloring work for the book. Um, Bigelow's account book names colorist, but the records become less complete as the book shifts from color printing, uh, shifts to color printing, and uh, tra this transforms the nature of the colorist's work. Um, I've often wondered if Louisa might be the unnamed lady in the account book who is checking out plates with a Mrs. Frothingham, uh, or if a friend recruited her to help color some sets of unbrown prints. Um, it's possible that Mary is simply drawing from published parts she had access to at home or at school, uh, but there are some clues in Mary's manuscript that makes me think otherwise. Uh, so for those of you who are less familiar with the book, um, American Medical Botany's color plates, um, as I said a second ago, uh, transitioned from hand coloring by women to color printing uh, after the first part was published. Um, the color printing process, which was done a la Pupé and Aquatins, allowed some plates to be entirely color printed. Um, many plates, however, continue to require women colorists to overpaint details. Uh, and without, again, getting too deep in the weeds about this process, um, plants had to be drawn in ways that allowed for selective inking of uh, the intaglio plates, um, but certain details remained hard or impossible to color this way. Uh, so to avoid these crucial miscommunications of color, um, women continue to take home sets of plates to paint them and return them to Bigelow. Uh, in Mary's manuscript, one plate comes from the first part, 
two from the second and three from the fourth. Uh, the order does not mimic the printed order in the parts of the volumes. Uh, all of the plates that Mary chose to reproduce required hand uh, painting uh, of some kind. Um, so the bearberry plant, um, which is the only image from the first part, um, was issued as a fully hand-colored pl plate uh, and as a color print um, with some overpainting. Um, it appears, uh, the drawing um, appears in the middle of Mary's volume and lacks a description entirely. Uh, Mary's version emphasizes light and shadow conveyed only by the hand-colored plates, not the flatter color printed plates that were issued to replace them. Uh, and so interestingly, there are some leaves painted with a gradient uh, opposite to what appears in the hand painted plates found um, in one of the library company copy copies. Uh, and so I suspect Mary might have been looking at plates uh, or a plate held back because of errors uh, or an unused proof. Uh, and Bearberry, incidentally, is a plate that was overproduced and survived loose and surplus sort of hand colored and uncolored into the 20th century. Um, it's really hard to see this from these images, and I apologize because I just, you know, could not get back in the middle of the pandemic to get better pictures of this. Um, but Mary's choices throughout, such as with um, Blue Gentian, tend to overemphasize the coloring strokes made by the colorist doing the overpainting. Um, so it seems to me that Mary is making choices that show she is copying the plates with an eye to understanding what the artist um, coloring the plates is doing. Um, there are other clues in play here, such as the exclusion of plates from the third part. Um, this may be coincidental, and it's possible that the order of plates is um, uh, simply reflects a child's whim. Um, but because she chose a combination of plants with like no thematic link, uh, she's not looking at pretty plants or local plants or plants like in a, um, a single part. Um, I think she's looking at loose plates, you know, that someone is working on while painting. Um, it isn't clear from Bigelow's accounts whether women received a set of plates for an entire part or a set of plates for one plant that needed to be included in several copies. Uh, so these six plants may be what Louisa and another female friend or relative was painting. Um, as for the descriptions, either Mary is working with short descriptions one might receive to identify an uncolored a uh, drawing or a coloring proof, or she's combing through pages of um, uh, technical description in published volumes to locate relevant information. Uh, now, I can't tell you if Mary was very precocious um, or not, uh, and frankly, her activities are interesting either way here. Uh, but my suspicion is, again, that she is learning how to color alongside her mother through this method of copying plates to produce painted herbaria. Uh, and mom is talking to her about botany and painting to prepare her for doing this work as an adult. Um, Mary, to my knowledge, um, never pursues book coloring as an adult, um, but she also grew up as color printing, um, particularly chromolithography, uh, would have reduced a need for women's uh, skilled labor, uh, as it did with many of the women who were working on this book um, between 1817 and 1821 when it shifted to color printing. Uh, and so I think that her manuscript um, may be evidence of the end of a particular era, era for um, you know, skilled women colorists working on these books. Uh, I will leave it there. Um, please do ask me questions in the Q&A. There's a lot I couldn't get into about process because of kind of time constraints, but I want to make sure there's ample time for um, questions, and questions and answers. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Jess. Um, okay. So the floor is open for questions. Um, thanks to all three of our speakers. I think there's there's a lot in there. A lot of different copying technologies were uh, discussed. If you want to ask a question, do just use your raise hand function, and you will um, pop up to the top of my queue. As people gather their thoughts. I, um, well, while people are thinking, Brian, I still don't understand what that ghost of the last, uh, the first line of the next page might be doing uh, if it was laid out already in TypeScript aid up in that way. How does that end up there? Um, my guess is, is that they were, um, if my theory is right that this was a long scroll, like a teletype, um, 
they probably either cut it up or, or, for example, they, they wouldn't have necessarily, as, as, as we know from hand press books, they wouldn't have necessarily needed to lay these, these um, pages out in numerical order. So they could have done, you know, they could have very easily done, you know, one, five, nine, et cetera. Um, and he, the, the printer could have done something like actually made like a, um, uh, an overlay with windows in it. And they could have put the different pages under it um, without, um, and that might have, that might have created an opportunity for that text to get cut off. Um, conversely, they could they also could have had multiple copies of this. Um, maybe again, maybe it wasn't a teletype. Maybe they actually typed this whole thing themselves, um, and maybe they were working off copies. And so they trimmed one and they left a little bit, and then the next they had the second copy that went onto the next page. Um, but those are the only those are the only things that make sense to me. Um, uh, because I can't think of a way that you would do that in, in mimeograph. Um, in mimeograph, you know where you're starting and you're stopping. Um, and, uh, and you really can't control sort of, if the page is getting pulled through the machine and, the, and the, it's typed on the stencil, um, when it goes through, you really can't tell it to not print that one line. There's really no mechanism to do that. Um, so it really, again, just suggested to me that there had to be some kind of photo intervention. Um, uh, and that pretty much leads you immediately to offset after that. Does that clarify? Uh -oh. Am I the one who's frozen or is Zach the one who's frozen? It's Zach. I think it's Zach, okay. <laughs> All right, we've lost it, so I'll jump on. Hi, uh, everybody. Um, Whitney, go ahead, ask, your, ask a question. Hi, thanks for these really um, fabulous papers. Um, I, wanted to, I wanted to hear more reflection because you don't, you don't have time in these short papers. Um, so I wanted to use this time to ask you to reflect a little bit more on what this kind of work on copy technologies, reaper graphics, facsimiles, and so on across all time periods does for bibliography, right? Like Brian kind of gestured a little bit towards this and Michelle's work of course is doing this and I can see the implications of Jessica's work, but I wanna like, like if we think really big picture, like does it change how we catalog things? Like does it change how we think about the long durée of objects? I just want to hear more big picture stuff, I guess, um, since I loved all these papers. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll take a stab at that. Um, so for me, like I'm very interested in sort of reconstructing these long processes and identifying objects um, in different phases of production or within a longer life cycle of um, producing experts um, because I do don't see women um, in certain roles attributed in sort of card catalog or card catalogs right I often will find these things like in strange miscellaneous folders like not kind of um, described in ways that I would want them described uh, and I think you know for folks to do that work we need a certain degree of understanding of, of like how women prepared um, to do work as colorists um, how to identify um, some of the weirder kind of iterations of these that look more like art than like science, um, right? And so we lose that kind of sense of scientific context um, that we'd want to see in a card catalog. Um, but I also just think it like complicates like a lot of stories that we tell about this book, um, or, or at least like uh, American medical botany, like, and this sort of um, goes back to the the article I wrote, not necessarily like Mary Minot's book. Um, we lose, for example, that Aura White Hitchcock um, appears to be like an illustrator on this by not like thinking about like how she's keeping these records like in painted herbariums. Um, we lose the sophisticated labor of the women who are like making choices about these plates. Um, I'm relieved to see that Zach is back because it's taken my host away from me. Um, but like, you know, I think we can't, we need to be attentive, attentive to these process, processes over kind of like the long history of, of, of um, what women are doing because 
you know, if not, we start to tell stories that women weren't involved with scientific books at all, or were doing kind of such rote, unimportant work that um, it's not really worth talking about them. So like, I see it, you know, um, as a way of like returning women to this narrative. Sorry about that. I don't know why everything froze. Sorry, I'm back, but sorry, Michelle, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that for me, in relation to photography and medieval manuscripts, um, the issue really is related to treating copies like objects rather than as surrogates. Um, and that issue, you know, this is the issue that sparked William Jerome Wilson. They had all these microphones at the Library of Congress. And they were not treated as if they were catalogable objects. They were treated as copies that didn't need their own call numbers of books that had call numbers, shelf marks, that were not held by the library. And so they ended up in sort of a pile. Um, and this was the problem that sparked all this imagination. Um, also, like accessing catalogs through televisions. There's a lot of amazing stuff in this 1943 um, article. Now, though, we have you know, medieval scholars obviously less concerned about properly cataloged microfilms because half of them are unreadable anyway um, for the purposes we might usually use them for. But the digital photographs are an enormous shifting archives that is now also not being bibliographed um, in the the ways that, uh, that are proper to objects. Um, and this is every day causing all kinds of extra new issues with what does it mean when we talk about a book um, or even an image of a book. I left out a whole preamble sort of uh, delineating the fact that there were no books here, there are pixels here and they're temporary. And uh, there's, you know, an hour to say about the production of every image, so to speak, that was here. Um, and the bibliographical component of that is so enormous that it seems impossible to tackle. And so for the most part, it's not tackled. And yet we keep losing sight of what actually our archive of historical knowledge actually represents. Um, and that's the state we're in. Yeah. I think that's such a crucial point that we almost um, have to forget it every time we go to do our research or else it, it, it's, it's so um, overwhelming to contemplate as we try to do historicist research that we keep forgetting it again and again. I think it's, it's a crucial point. Um, okay, I don't know whether Courtney or Lahari has a question at this point, but, but one of them does. Um. Hi, uh, I just really enjoyed uh, your presentation, Jessica. I'm a botanist and it really uh, spoke to me a lot because I also really enjoy collecting botanical prints. Um, but uh, I really liked how you mentioned that thing about like bringing women back as a narrative. Um, I feel like so often like women botanists are ignored, especially from a certain time. So I was wondering um, two things specifically. How did you come across this um, botanical manuscript and second are there more such comprehensive uh, compendia or manuscripts from like young children and third do we know anything else about like the later life of Mary Minor uh yeah um so I I will say that like um I have found quite a lot of manuscripts that look like this um less sort of more with the, the medical kind of botany um aspect to it but um it's it's pretty common actually for female seminaries to train girls to produce this type of manuscripts and um in the course of sort of my research um i've seen sort of dozens of these from in different contexts and um, a lot of my uh, book project uh, attempts to explain like how to read them in an appropriate context in order to understand sort of the scientific labor that goes into them um this this particular um manuscript was a, a surprise because I wasn't really expecting to find it in this folder. I think it's in um, miscellaneous subject science. Uh, and at that point, um, like I had discovered that so many of these objects had been categorized in ways that like I, I would, that I personally would describe just differently that I started sort of pulling sort of any related material um, and any archive I visited just fishing for sort of women's manuscripts that um, 
were not um, on most people's radar are not discoverable by sort of simple searches in online catalogs. Um, trying to remember the other questions. Um, oh, what happened to Mary Minot? Um, uh, so Mary um, actually, so there's some correspondence documenting her later years at the Massachusetts Historical Society. Um, Mary lives a fairly, you know, interesting social life as far as I can see. Um, she never gets married. Um, she travels a lot. And um, unfortunately, like enough of her correspondence is missing that it's really kind of hard um, to tell like what she's doing compared to some of the other members of her family. Um, I'm in the process of sort of revisiting um, uh, the William Minot papers and the Louisa Davis Minot papers. Um, there are sort of five or six fairly large interrelated collections um, at MHS trying to like gl glance at little tidbits here and there. Um, and I've also been looking to see if um, there's published drawings that I'm missing, like um, locating her mother's work is also very difficult because she's not um, often identified as Mrs. Minot, it's always LM. Um, so like realizing it's, um, you know, a drawing by Louisa Minot sometimes requires checking against the drawings that still exist at Massachusetts Historical Society to make an identification. Um, I wish I knew more about Mary, um, but like sometimes all we have are these like manuscripts that show up because they've been separated from like the rest of the papers. Um, and like you have to learn how to read them, um, I think, in order to kind of tell the stories of like what girls are doing. Um, so that that would that's going to be my final say about that, because I've already talked for too long and Jerry raised his hand. Um, but thanks you go for ahead, uh, thank, thank you all three um, for these, these wonderful and thought-provoking um, presentations. Um, and I'm thinking in, in maybe not terribly coherent ways right now about how you have all effectively emphasized the material side of the material text. Um, equation perhaps. Um, to some extent, thinking in varying degrees about the text part of the text um, in, and, and these, are, these are all three of them very different kinds of creatures. So in Michelle's instance, the form, whether it's a physical form or a digital form is, you know, hugely different as it goes along. But the one thing that's absolutely contact, constant is, is the text itself of, of, of manuscript 80. That is, there is the, the physical object that is on the library shelf. There are the various digitizations, but the, the text, the words, the words on the pages, whatever those pages are, um, are identical um, in the same place. They're mechanically reproduced. In Jessica's case, um, of course, Jessica is looking in some ways much more at the images and the variance in the images and, and is able to present to us some questions about where Mary is getting her, her texts from um, and um, is positing multiple sources, um, but her, her interests are not, are not primarily in those texts. But then we come to, to Brian. And Brian, I, I'm, I'm wondering in trying to figure out what this peculiar edition that you're looking at is, um, you, you have focused on the paper, on the binding, on, on the mechanics of reproduction. I'm wondering whether you've examined the text itself and in a very old fashioned way, um, were there textual variants from the New Yorker first printed edition to the to the pocket editions that were published later? I mean, you, you have all of these these, if you will, multiples of of Hiroshima circulating at within a very short time of of, of its initial appearance. Are there textual variants of of maybe even a very small nature of of, of changes in punctuation? Um, of typos that get reproduced, anything that could could lead you a bit closer to 
to the sources of the particular version of Hiroshima that you're looking at? Um, only in a, um, what I hope is a statistically significant way, but not in a comprehensive way. Um, so I have certainly compared large portions of the text to various um, versions of, of uh, published versions that we know. Um, but I have not done it in any kind of comprehensive sense. Um, and, uh, and I have not done it, you know, across a lot of different editions. Um, I mean, I think there is, I, I, I mean, there's, there's a lot been written about, about the publication his, history of, of Hiroshima. And, and, and in fact, there, there was a book published last year whose name is escaping me at the moment. It was about Hiroshima um, that, that talks a lot about the publication history. Um, and, uh, um, All right. and so I've thought about it in, in, in that sense. And at a certain point, yeah, I'll have to do this. I, I, I mean, depending on how far down this rabbit hole I, I want to go. And part of, part of how far down I will go in no small part will be determined by what exactly this ends up being in my life. Um, if this ends up being inventory, um, and it may, um, then I have to, for better or worse, come up with some sort of value time equation. Um, and I can't spend 40 hours on this comprehensively going through the text. If, however, um, this becomes part of, say, the duplicate, my teaching collection, um, which I also have, um, I might spend a great deal more time on this. Um, uh, but, you know, to answer your question, I have done, I have done um, uh, uh, a bit of uh, comparison. I have not found any differences. Um, uh, and, um, and I don't know what I would find if I go, if I go deeper, but that's certainly um, a next step for sure. Okay, thank you. Um, I mean, one final observation that I guess many of us have, which is really more about the peculiarity of of the New Yorker. Um, so they gave over the entire issue to her issue to Hiroshima, and the cover of that issue is of people cavorting in summer activities and presumably some weird version of of Central Park. Um, and yeah, that, that it's New a little Yorker discordant. Um, very uh, weird object. Yeah. One interesting thing happened actually a few months ago, um, which was that um, a librarian in the Midwest somewhere, if I'm remembering correctly, found in their collection that this issue was actually issued, at least in some places, with a wraparound band, with a belly band around the issue, um, which um, I think is in no small part um, a reaction to that, recognizing that there is a kind of um, tension between this sort of fun summer cover and the and the very serious contents inside um and th there was actually a bit of press about it if you if you google it you can find it um uh -huh. so i think there was some recognition of that um but the other interesting thing is is you know i think part of the part of the reason that that, that cover exists um is because originally again they were thinking that this was going to be over the course of four issues they were going to do four issues four excerpts um and uh th this was all very much in flux as it's being edited, as it's going to press, this is all happening in a very short period of time. They're, they're really kind of moving very quickly. And I think that cover in an interesting way is a reflection of that sort of how all of this was being kind of figured out um, in the moment. Yeah, um, but I, I, I mean, people, I'm, I'm sure somebody here knows more than I, I think it's only under Tina Brown's editorship that the covers actually start being responsive and in, in yeah. some way to the content of the issue. So it's very, very late in the in the history of the New Yorker. So, thank and you. To follow up on your commentary about the text and the material for the manuscript, because even though it is a single copy and unique um, in its own way, um, and I sort of brushed past the fact that it's about King Arthur and the Holy Grail. In fact, the Arthurianism is directly responsible for the format that it has. Um, it is an English copy of a French illustrated book. Um, and the layout and the design of it is all about replicating the form because of the social connotations of the text as an aristocratic for, uh, content of text that can travel into a new social dimension in English, which is a merchant community in London in the 1400s. On the far side of that, 
Um, there's a current of tech medievalism that I develop um, around the early history of computing and microfilming. And there again, the grail and the Arthurianism come back around as metaphors for a certain ideology of technology of durable, elusive solutions that will be perfect if only we can get the right tech. Um, and so the text and the formats are in fact in dialogue from the very beginning, pushing back and forth um, through the centuries. Thanks, John. John has a question, but I think is barely on Zoom, but John, can you ask your question? I'll do my best. Sorry, apologies on some Zoom issues, but just wanted to say thank you to everybody and um, trying to maybe follow a little bit on, on that immediate discussion with some thoughts um, to tie these things together as best we can. Um, this won't work for Brian so much, but I wanted to just raise the sort of issue of color um, because I thought, uh, well, um, certainly Jessica's talk, the, this whole interesting question of how it is best to reproduce color, who is best to do it, and how, you know, a new technology essentially replaces um, a way of colorizing um, seems to be, you know, kind of a technology, technology change at the heart of your, of your work here. And I just love your thoughts about that. Um, it connects to Michelle's in my mind, because I have to say, I've always found fascinating the microfilm problem in that, you know, the color is gone. And I wonder if the early, um, you know, uh, triumphalists of the microfilm uh, market, who were many, as you say, um, ever commented on this, because it's always fascinated me that, you know, um, that in that very black and white world, there seemed to be no problem celebrating that. Um, and I guess a, a, a different thread that relates a little bit is, 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 is paper um, for all three of you maybe, um, but maybe Brian, you could tell us a little more if you think that is Japanese paper on the, uh, uh, we, I guess we get that tested, right? And, you know, or that, that uh, the, the, the artifact in Japan side of your story, I just found fascinating. So thanks to all of you. Um, just in terms of my confidence about my attribution, um, it's low. It's it's really a hypothesis at this point. Um, uh, uh, I, I really am just sort of, it's a weird little book and I can't, I, I mean, a couple of things I didn't touch on, you, you know, it's, it's weird in a number of ways. Like if, if it was offset in this manner on a large industrial press and it, 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 it implies a, multiples, and not only does it imply some multiples, it actually implies a fair number of multiples. Um, like you don't go through the trouble of doing all this to run off 20 copies. If you were gonna run off 20 copies, you'd actually mimeograph the thing. So, so it, it, it suggests a scale that is completely in conflict with this sort of hand done, put it into an album sort of um, format. Um, that again, I don't have an adequate explanation for other than to say it's odd. Um, you know, I, I, I wonder again if, if this is sort of disguised, you know, is this a version of the text that could be carried around in Japan where it wouldn't attract attention, could be circulated around. But again, if that hypothesis is correct, I would think I would find some more copies of this somewhere in OCLC. And I have dug as deep as I can, try, you know, I've dug pretty deep and not found one, um, which again is since many of us use OCLC, probably know that doesn't mean it's not in there somewhere um, or not in a finding aid somewhere, um, uh, I, but I haven't found it yet. Um, so uh, uh, that, that's, my, that's my best answer at this point. Michelle, did, did you want to comment on the microphone part of it? Yeah, sure. Um, it, from all that I can tell, nobody really cared much about color. There was a, the document mentality um, was sufficient. And the very notion that some of the manuscripts that were uh, copied during the British Manuscript Project between 1941 and 44 that are now cataloged at the University of Michigan, when you read the description, it's horrifying to imagine this would be what would survive um, of these books. 
Uh, and many of the copies are in fact unusable as text. And yet there was a sense of the transparency of text. You could just capture it and you wouldn't even need those manuscripts anymore. You'd have the text. Um, so it really is in the form of the unreadable films, you have really the performance of this ideology of copying itself as, an end, as its own end in some sense. Um, the last thing I would say about paper is that in the same period in the 30s, the new the, is when there's a, the same people involved in microfilm, of course, driven by the disintegration of 19th century papers. Um, and uh, the new standards that were being promoted, uh, Robert Binkley, whose name may be known to some here, um, was 15th century paper, precisely the kind that MSC was made of. Um, and there's a uh, real convergence of this kind of paper as a technological model for new technologies at the same time that new copying technologies are rescuing those same kinds of books. I mean, it's all rather too neat, um, but that's very precisely what happens between 1925 and 1950. Jessica, you wanna, and we're back to the first part of John's question. Yeah, um, so, I regret that I only had a, a brief amount of time to explain the complicated um, uh, math that is the uh, understanding American medical botany. Um, so I have, you know, both a published piece that thinks about the implications of, again, this switch for the colorist, and I have an unpublished piece, um, you know, on Ora White Hitchcock and sort of why she uh, disappears as illustrator because of this color printing process. And I'm in the, I'm trying to think through sort of how to marry the moving parts related to American medical botany right now, both in terms of illustration, coloring, and sort of um, use to reify sort of these cycles of women preparing to do book illustration. Um, and so the part that you didn't hear is that um, in Harvard Botanicals, um, collection of um, drawings related to Jacob Bigelow's American Medical Botany, there are a bunch of cut up um, uh, images. And um, I suspect that the, the, you know, the way plants were drawn, um, set by Ora White Hitchcock, did not accommodate the color printing process. And so Bigelow had to trace, um, right? There are all these scraps that indicate that he was tracing her drawings, um, reassembling them and kind of spreading them out on a plate so they, they, the a la papier process could be done um, by inking kind of distinct parts of the plate. Um, and as a consequence, um, you know, he doesn't really credit her openly as um, a contributing illustrator, although when she dies, um, there are funeral sermons that make it pretty clear that everybody in her networks understood that she contributed um, illustrations to this book. And um, I'm in the process of trying to figure out, you know, what's going on with this. Um, I think the illustrations that survive intact are the illustrations that were not ultimately used as plates. And then the illustrations that were used were cut up for this process and again, traced and copied, right? Um, in the piece that I linked in chat, like this talks about, again, like changing the nature of the labor from sophisticated, you know, full color drawings where women had to be really um, uh, like intensely aware of like the color of plants and like how, how like to marry like particular features to match certain aspects of the, the te technical description. Um, and how that is being changed when you get to a point in the, the account book where they're shifting from plates to patterns. Um, and that fundamentally changes um, the way women are sort of doing the painting work um, when they're just kind of filling in holes. Although I would argue also that like there's still a level of sophistication that's needed for quality control. Um, but the, that shift in that um, case like to color printing um, because they're trying to regulate consistency across plates, right? Like they think there's inconsistency introduced by the colorist. Um, like just silently erases women and gradually makes them like less, like they don't need to the same level of botanical skill um, to do this work anymore. And so that to me, like documenting that process is the important part for me. Thanks. Um... I think we have time for like one more question if someone has something on their mind that they want to ask. 
If not, then I'm sensing some pre-Thanksgiving uh, weariness, so uh, we don't have to keep the three of you too much longer. Um, I really enjoyed this session. I think that um, it's it's fascinating the way all three of your talks take uh, the idea of the copy, which has so often been a kind of degraded or um, subsidiary concept and make it the primary um, aspect. And um, I just thought there was a lot of really interesting um, food for thought here. So thanks to all three of you um, for a great session and hope to see uh, many of you back next week. We'll be entirely online again, but I promise my tech will be better. Um, and apologies that I, my iPad totally froze up. Um, so hope to see you all back next week. And thanks again to Jessica, Brian, and Michelle.